Sylvia Massey has crossed paths with many rock legends during her career, including Tool, Slayer, System of a Down and the Foo Fighters. And she's also known for her unique technique, adventure recording, which is detailed in her new book, Recording Unhinged. Earlier this year, we went on our own adventure to Sylvia's studio in Oregon to get a taste of some of the strange techniques and tools she uses. I think adventure recording includes all kinds of things, from the choice of uh, equipment that you use, the techniques that you use, uh, the direction you give your, your uh, client, your artist, um, to get the best performances, the places that you record, um, the whole series of events that are from pre-production, through recording, through mixing, even, uh, even in anticipation of mastering, it's all part of the adventure and it should be as memorable as possible. Even if uh, parts of what you do during the time you're recording don't work out, it's all part of the, um, the experience of recording. Well, over the years, I've gone from uh, the rule book of recording to really stretching out and trying things that haven't been tried. For instance, uh, early on, I, I thought, uh, what is the loudest noise that I can make in the studio? And uh, the studio owners got really upset with me when I started bringing in pianos and shooting them with shotguns and uh, things like this. But I really think that the art of recording should be an adventure and you should be able to uh, really stretch your wings and try things even if, you, even if they're bound to fail. And what it does is it just allows you the freedom uh, to do something really good. You never know if it's going to work out or not. So I suggest that adventure recording means you don't have to be in a studio environment at all. You can be anywhere. And if you have a laptop these days, you can record anywhere. In fact, if you have an iPhone, you can pretty much record anywhere, right? So uh, uh, there's no limits. Uh, for instance, let's see, uh, one time I took a guitar and dragged it up to the top of a cliff in Malibu at Indigo Ranch. And we, uh, we got an extremely long instrument cable and brought up a Marshall stack to that cliff too and got a, an incredible feedback and threw it off the cliff, recording it. It was a cacophony, it was an incredible noise. And we thought, well, we're gonna have this great recording, we're gonna put it in on an intro of a song or a segue or something and on this album. It was Machines of Love and Grace. And uh, we got the recording back and it really wasn't that great. And we tried it here and there. We tried it as segues. Uh, it just never worked out. But we'll never forget the experience of this monstrous sound on the top of a cliff and throwing the guitar off. So it was well worth the, the effort, even though it, it like blew a whole day out of our schedule. <laughs> Sometimes you just got to do this. Uh, Recently, I went and recorded in a castle in Germany, and um, it was more about the vibe of uh, being in a castle. Uh, actually, I've done two projects there. One was a classical project, viola, piano, um, sonatas, and then the other one was a Swedish metal band called Avatar. And the, being in the castle environment brought an entirely different feel to the recording. And you'll talk to, uh, to other engineers who've done the same type of thing. In the book, Recording Unhinged, I spoke with Al Schmidt about his experiences and he uh, took uh, Paul Horn to the Taj Mahal and they recorded in the Taj Mahal. And there's an incredible story about that. Um, uh, Bob Clear Mountain recorded a band on top of a mountain, uh, the, the mountain uh, above the Hollywood sign. And there's all kinds of stories like this. As good as classic mic choices like the SM58 and U87 are, they're not really adventurous choices. Sylvia talked us through some of the bizarre microphones that she uses. So it, it's about the place that you record, it's about uh, the technique and the equipment that you use too. And I've got a few things that I can 
show you that are uh, interesting. As far as microphones go, um, for instance, if you take a, a guitar like this, this is a Dan Electro 12 string, it's kind of a crappy guitar. And <laughs> the, the pickups are really microphonic. But if you set this tuned to an open tuning in front of a kick drum and actually record it to a track, it has this incredible resonant resonance that adds to a certain type of music. It works for some types of music. Use it so use it as a kick drum mic. You know, uh, you can use it for vocals. It's an incredible microphone for vocals. Actually, you know this kind of thing. And so this Jay Z mic is very unusual. I mean, it has a you know it's you can see right through it. Uh, I use this uh, for a recording in a cave. It's appropriate, isn't it? Another great mic is this 12 gauge mic. <laughs> it's made out of a shotgun shell. I like it for acoustic guitar. Uh, it's, it's made out of a shotgun shell. It's cool. If you, ha if you were playing an acoustic guitar, with this, you'd be just like having so much fun because it's so weird, right? So, that doesn't make any sense, does it? Adventure recording. There's other things you can do to create different sounds. For instance, with a guitar, Matt Wallace talks about it in the book. If you do a very simple, uh, simple thing with a surface transducer and I'll bring out a few. Okay. These are examples of surface transducers and what I do uh, according to Matt Wallace's instructions is you attach this to the headstock or the body of a, a wooden guitar and then send the recorded signal back through this and it vibrates the wood of the guitar and it creates an, a really beautiful sustain and it's really easy to control. I actually, uh, in the book, I did several illustrations and I've illustrated that design. So here's that surface transducer. It's attached to the headstock of the guitar and what you do is you take and put a little amplifier on that so that it, it becomes a speaker, basically. And you take the signal from your recording, here's the Pro Tools, uh, and you send it down through a volume pedal, through that line amp to that surface transducer, and it vibrates the wood of the guitar, and it creates this beautiful loop feedback sustain. And Matt Wallace uh, showed me this technique. It works fantastic. Let's see, what else do I have? Ah. Uh, you can also build your own equipment. You can build microphones. My father actually taught me how to build a microphone out of a telephone. And I have one here. It's a very simple design. You just get the handset from a telephone. And you pull the the carbon button out, put that aside, and then you take an XLR cable and you replace the wires on the cradle with this one side of an XLR, let's say, right? Microphone cable. And now what you'll want to do is across one of these leads you want to put a battery. And I just took an old battery and just soldered it right in there. It's 1.5 volts, 9 volt won't work, because what you're trying to do is get it up to line level. So now you've just created a, a microphone out of an old handset. Sounds just like a telephone, but remember, it's line level, it's not mic level. It works great. And keep your eyes open for any weird and wonderful microphones that are out there. I've got collections of microphones, the strangest things, they're everywhere. This one is really unusual. I think it was made by Fender or actually rebranded by Fender. 
and it has a spring reverb built into it. It's really quite silly. You can adjust the amount of reverb. Well, this mic is really kind of horrible. So it's, uh, it's one of those things you pull it out when you want to have fun. Probably won't work for anything, but it's worth a try. You never know. It just inspires more creativity. A lot of these exercises are simply to get you out of, uh, out of the restricted thinking that really you can do anything. There are tried and true methods that will always work, like using a 1073 EQ. You really can't go wrong. Try other things. I mean, there's ways to do recordings without EQ. It's just a matter of mic placement. Like, it's so important when you're doing drum recording to really look at your phase relationship between mics. No matter what mics you're using, if your phase relationship is in order, your recording is going to sound fuller and better. So you can use inexpensive mics and, and get a much better result if you're just, if you're just conscious of a few things. Uh, but at the same time, don't limit yourself to something that's in a textbook. No adventure would be complete without effect, and Sylvie's a big fan of rack gear, as well as some weird and wonderful contraptions. I love rack effects, and I still use uh, the equipment out of the racks. Let's say I want uh, compressed sound. Well, there's many ways to skin that cat. The first thing I would do would be to crank my mic pre on the 1073 to get that kind of saturation and it kind of clamps things down. So that will give you an instant type of compression. Tape compression is also good. Uh, other uh, compressors that I've, I have lying around, um, I have this fantastic thing behind me that I nicknamed the Army Man. Actually, Serge from System of a Down uh, actually nicknamed it the Army Man because he stuck a little Army Man inside it and it's stayed ever since. I found that in a fellow's garage in Glendale. He was an old radio guy and he'd had it for years. And I uh, dragged it out, dusted it off. I didn't dust it too much. It's actually still full of dirt and it sounds horrible, but it's awesome. And so I'll never fix it. I don't know what's the matter with it, but it, it's broken in a really wonderful way. There's another effect that not that many people know about. It's actually a great plug-in now, a UA plug-in. It's called the Cooper Time Cube. And it was developed in the 70s um, by Bill Putnam. And I think his name is Don Cooper. And uh, it, it has two pieces. There's the rack uh, brain. I've got one right here in the, in the rack, the Cooper Time Cube brain and that's connected to a box and the box has um, actually a garden hose in it and the idea is that you send a signal down one end of the the um, garden hose actually you send a, send your signal through a tiny speaker down one end of the garden hose by the time it gets to the other end of the garden hose uh, to a microphone there's a delay so it's a very early analog delay, and it worked great. You'll hear it on uh, many albums from the early 70s. I think uh, ELO used it. I think uh, it's on some Queen albums. Um, I, and I drew uh, an, a diagram on how you can build your own, and this is also in the book. Can I show that to you? It's simple. Basically, all you need is a speaker, a funnel, a garden hose, and a microphone and some duct tape. I suggest a SM57, and you just uh, send your signal down one end into the speaker through the hose, and then pick it up with the SM57 on the other end. I've done this several times. It works great. Oh God. One thing about using a hose, <laughs> one thing about using a hose is uh, you've got a fixed delay uh, length. 
However, if you get a really long hose and you send the signal down one end and you pick it up with a microphone on the other, you can actually change the timing of that by cutting the hose. So if you're, doing, if you're using this kind of technique during a, a mixed project, let's say, you want to start with your slower songs first. <laughs> because by the time you get to the last song, your, your hose is too short, you know what I mean? And you can't change it. Another great use for a hose, incredibly, is for a drum room. And the way I use it is I'll just put an SM57 on one end, like this, right? Just tape it right on there. Tape up the other end of the hose. This is about a 10-foot hose. It's not very long. But it, tape up the other end. And then drape this underneath the drum kit. And what you get from the sound of this is basically a drum room sound, but the cymbals are really reduced, so you don't have these screaming cymbals. And then you pump it up with a good compressor like the Army Man. Wow. Always have a handy hose with you. Finally, we were treated to a wonderful vocal performance tip that's quite unlike any other. I use several techniques for inspiring uh, vocalists. And one thing I actually learned from my mother is that, uh, she's an opera singer, is that um, there's certain ways to gain control. It's the way you stand. It's where your, your stomach is in. Your clen you clench your, your stomach in a way that you're getting ready to get punched is how she describes it. She also says that you need to clench your sphincter. And uh, I had her describe this to me in a little more detail. And she says that if, you are, if, you're, if you're singing and you have uh, a tight sphincter, <laughs> uh, you have much more control. So I made a drawing to demonstrate this. Well, obviously you want the tightest sphincter possible. So we would go with sphincter C. And that's why there's a little check right <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Mother. If I can give you one tip, just don't be lazy. If it takes more effort to create a sound instead of just getting it out of the box, go ahead and take the time to do it. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe to the YouTube channel. And you can subscribe to the magazine in print on the website or on tablet. Thanks for watching.